I apologize for being late. An exceptionally unpleasant letter arrived for me from the Chancellor, and that has made me feel extremely unwell. I apologize to you. I had hoped in amusing and witty form to write a little verse for you. It turns out to be merely a second-rate curse. I apologize. I would remind you that uh, I would like you to have your substantial papers ready on Friday. I would remind you that uh, the final test will be on June the 12th, which is a Wednesday. And uh, the L's to the Z's will be asked to appear at 8.30, and the A's to the K's will be asked to appear at 10 o'clock. The test is compulsory. I wish I could lecture to you in a good humor. I'm not sure that I can lecture to you at all. I'm having considerable difficulty even in enunciating this morning. I'd ask for the New World Symphony. I must tell you quite simply that I have learned to detest the New World, I'm afraid. And this university has been made a more or less perpetual horror to me. However, we leave that aside. Would you put the lights down and the screen down and I will attempt to lecture to you. I apologize, I simply am not myself. Impressionism is a word which is used very widely and it may help to explain how it is that I've danced round it and round it and round it like some little young lassie of Degas skirting round the edges of those immaculately and extraordinarily uh, composed paintings. In fact, it is partly a matter of place and partly a matter of chronology. When I was a young man, I was warned by my first art teacher in the early 1940s, in the early 1940s, my dears, to beware of Impressionism. He said, Rembrandt is all right and Hogarth is terrific. Impressionists, we do, surprisingly enough, include no less and no other a talent than the wonderful Maurice Prendergast, who painted really from the 1890s to the 1920s, and who under any other dispensation, if he wasn't such a sweet fellow, might well have been hailed as a minor fauvist, uh, a minor wild beast, rather than an impressionist. And what has happened, of course, is that the word impressionism is used to cover any painting which is fairly loosely painted, any painting which is painted in bright and pleasing colors, any painting which happens to uh, uh, address an agreeable subject matter. Uh, and that is a popular view. The more precise view is it is a movement which started about 1868 or so, and lasted at about 1880 or 1881. And the, the true Impressionists can be more or less numbered on the fingers of one hand. Monet, Renoir, Pissarro, Sisley, for a very brief while, a man called Pazil, for a very brief while, Caillabot, and that is almost it. However, I thought it would be interesting first just to look at the kind of wide periphery, partly because it enables you to see American artists. And here is Prendergast with his liking for that impressionist topic, the beach scene, a topic which really comes into prominence with Monet's master, Eugène Boudin. Let's have a look at the next. And here's another uh, Prendergast. It's actually Central Park in New York, but it could so easily be the Bois de Boulogne, could it not? Uh, it could so easily be one of those cheerful, uh, middle of the afternoon, spanking, trotting occasions which Impressionists supposedly liked to uh, uh, paint. What makes it, apart from 
the very, very different use of color, when you notice the unbroken blue here, you notice the unbroken red here, uh, you notice the red parasols here. The other thing that makes it very unlike the center of Impressionism, besides its much more schematic approach to color, is the formality of the composition. And here are all these uh, little uh, seats lined up almost as though they are on a model train. And the horizontals are broken by very clear verticals in a way which is really opposed to essential uh, impressionist practice in the 1870s. Let's have a look at another very like an Impressionist, and of course painting a famous Impressionist city, Venice. But once again, it's Maurice Prendergast, and if you look at the color, you look once again at the use of primaries, at very clear contours, at a paint which is not broken up in the typical optical fashion of true Impressionism. Of course, there were, let's have a look at the next, there were American uh, Impressionists. And there were Belgian Impressionists, and there were English Impressionists, and there were German Impressionists. And I put next to uh, the Prendergast, of course, another typical street scene. And the Impressionists, particularly Monet and Renoir, but chiefly Monet, uh, invented the view, of a the view of a road from an upper window. It had actually been done in photography before Monet takes it up. But Monet uses it, Basile uses it, Caillebotte uses it, and in his old age, uh, Pissarro uses a high vantage point looking down upon a street, but this is none of those. This is young Mr. Ensor, the masked man, who in the early 1880s was still a very young man. He was one of the first people outside France really to paint a small clutch of semi-impressionist pictures, this time of Ostend. And we can show you another one. Uh, in the case of Ensor, who was of English parentage, the influence of Turner can also be felt, can't it? Really quite strongly. And of course that raises another very interesting issue. Were the Impressionists the lineal descendants of uh, Constable and Turner? And there's one piece of evidence which suggests that they were. Because just at the time when true Impressionism was coming into existence, that is to say the end of the 1860s, the beginning of the 1870s, the Franco-Prussian War erupted and Monet and Pissarro both came to England and saw Turners and Constables in the Tate Gallery. The real issue is which Turners, which Constables did they see in the National Gallery uh, as it then was? It wasn't the Tate Gallery, I'm sorry, it wasn't the Tate Gallery at that stage, it was the National Gallery. Did they see rain, steam and speed? Did they see those very late Turner shipwrecks? I suspect they certainly didn't see the unfinished Turners, they didn't see the great uh, Norham Castle, for instance. They didn't see the unfinished paintings of uh, uh, Lord Egremont's seat at Petwa. They must have seen quite a number of constables, but of course Impressionist painting is closer to Turner in many ways than it is to Constable. It's not till the 1890s, so far as we know, that uh, Monet really gets to know Turner in his more advanced phase as well. But it's possible, you see, that Ensor did. Though there again, in Ensor, you can see in the 1890s a very different approach. Here's another Ensor, and notice one other dear little thing about it. In spite of its rather gray colors, it's got a certain amount of snow, and fascinatingly, because Ensor is one of the most extraordinary of all painters, he seems to have included a premonition of Mondrian down in this corner. Ah. Uh, and Mondrian, of course, a Dutch painter, and probably knew Ensor fairly well. Anyhow, so we have a Belgian Ensor on the periphery for a while. Let's have a look at the next uh, of Impressionism. And there's another one, a quieter one. Of course, you're shaking your heads and saying, well, not really Impressionism, because the color is not fully Impressionist. It, it certainly doesn't suggest those wonderful, sparkling spring and summer days in Ensor. This is another American called Trotchman. And here you feel much closer to the center of Impressionism. Here you feel closer to Monet. And Trotchman is certainly an interesting painter, and I think of all the American Impressionists, let's have a look at the next. He comes perhaps closest 
and here is a Trotchman uh, painting of a snow scene. It doesn't quite have the blues of a Monet snow scene, but it's getting in that direction, and Trotchman was particularly fond of snow. And many of his, many of his paintings are about snow. And indeed, what one discovers, of course, is that in the 1890s, People like Robinson, American, come and stay in Giverny, come close as they can, learn. They, they, they look over Monet's shoulder at his practice. But by 1890, Monet has passed the high watermark of Impressionism of the 1870s and going on his own very personal trip. So we can see that we can see that, that Impressionism can be used loosely and it can be applied tightly. I wished I got a better John Singer Sargent to show you. This is not a bad John Singer Sargent. This is an early John Singer Sargent, an American expatriate who lived almost all his life in Europe. He did come to America and do a perfectly tremendous and appalling portrait of Teddy Roosevelt, and he did the most ghastly frescoes uh, on these ghastly wall paintings in the Boston Public Library, but was chiefly a fashionable portrait painter. When he relaxed, he did landscapes. And uh, the landscape, as you can see, the clouds do suggest don't they, Monet of the 1860s. They are the clouds over the Normandy coast. And I think one of the things that one simply has to realize with landscape is that landscape is always of a particular place. And the French Impressionists paint the north coast of France, and they paint round Paris, in the suburbs of Paris, and across towards Normandy. Eventually, they begin to discover the south of France, and when they discover the south of France, their painting changes. Renoir eventually discovers Italy, and his painting changes almost out of recognition. Renoir also discovers North Africa, and that alters his whole sense of color. But the true Impressionist, the true Impressionist moment is round the environs of Paris. And it is not for nothing that Raywald, in his great book on impression, publishes a map of that area of France. And of course, uh, Monet came from La Havre, and here is a northern French painting by um, Monet. And then I said, of course, Germans also get involved in sort of impressionism. And he has a sort of impressionist painting. It's sort of impressionist, but it could also emerge out of the Barbizon school. It is generic landscape painting of the late 19th century. And some people call it impressionism. Other people are purists. It's by a German called Liebermann. And we've got another Liebermann-esque. And you can see, in fact, that he is in some ways closer to Barbizon. Uh, but here, he seems to have got brisked up a bit, doesn't he? And this could be like a rather bad Pissarro, possibly. Uh, a rather, a, the sort of Pissarro which Pissarro painted sometimes in England, or might have been painted by Camille Pissarro, San Lucian Pissarro, who was a good painter, but nothing like as good as his dad. And here you see a, a very interesting issue in the reds here, which move away from Impressionist practice. One of the th notions of Impressionist practice is broken color uh, and the primacy of general color rather than local color. General color suggests, you see, the action of light, the action of the atmosphere, rather than the native, naive hue of particular objects. And here, in fact, you can actually see that uh, this particular piece of roof is pushing its way, isn't it, to the front of the picture. Uh, it really wants to, this bright piece of red wants to come zinging past the tree and assault you immediately. And uh, you know one of the great properties of colors. And it is so important to think about this if you want to understand the Impressionists, and in particular, of course, if you want to understand Cezanne. The classical way of dealing with recession in terms of color really sets the stage. And what the classical way is, is to say that cool colors recede, and warm colors come closer. Now, Leonardo knew this. He knew about blue distances. What Cezanne does, which is so important, is to substitute that whole theory for any other theory of modeling. Because there's another theory of modeling. That other theory of modeling is that uh, you use bright light on one side of a, a volume and shadow on the other side of the volume. Uh, Cezanne applies the notion of warm colors advancing and cool colors receding with a degree of system which, of course, the Impressionists themselves don't use. Because the Impressionists have such a complex sense 
of immediacy and immediate visual effects and they see little bits of light bouncing from here a reflection of a reflection of a reflection of a reflection of a reflection and you all know the most interesting and tragic story about Monet and he tells it in a letter and he tells it only revealing a part of the truth he describes how he was with a dear friend who was dying and he was deeply upset because she was sinking rapidly but all the time she was approaching death and death was approaching her Monet nonetheless was looking at the coloration round her eyes and saying I think if I added a little bit more cobalt I could just catch that particular color and I think a little bit more carmine just up there because that's a very interesting color and you know who the person was he was referring to? It was his mistress and wife, Camille. And it tells you something about the passion of Monet for pure color analysis. That even at this moment, his eye is occupied with mixing color and seeing color. And mixing and matching, of course, is enormously important. And you can see that Lieberman here really is not mixing many different colors. Uh, it's it's uh, the cabbage greens, I mean, what you might call spinach, uh, which is much closer to Constable than true impressionist practice of watching those greens and dissolving them into all sorts of prismatic effects. Even the English, in spite of the warnings of schoolmasters like mine, became involved in sort of Prussianist practice. And here is an English painter called Philip Wilson Steer, and in the 1890s he did some absolutely beautiful paintings of seasides. He was besotted by gawky adolescent girls with extremely long legs, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, you can also see that in fact his paint is a little bit rich and clotted. And you can also see another interesting thing, which is that he has a sense of silhouette, he has a sense of drawing taking an equal place with the way in which light moves, uh, which takes him to some extent away from Impressionist. But I want to warn you about a very simple thing. And it is true, of course, in all fields of life, not just simply within the field of the history of art and the history of Impressionism. And that is philosophers, are the greatest makers of Procrustean beds. And after the philosophers come, amongst others, the art historians. And they lop off a leg here, uh, and they pull out a neck there, in order to make the myriad individual painters and the myriad individual canvases fit a definition. And it is more important for you to feel a painting than to fit a definition. And Impressionism is, after all, initially something like a term of abuse. And so we should use it lightly and humorously and gracefully and really get beyond it and look at the individual careers of individual painters. And we would look at greater, this is a Degas, which is interesting to put with the Wilson Steer, a seaside scene, and here's another Wilson Steer seaside scene. Wilson Steer could never draw in the way that Degas could. Um, it would be nice to do a straightforward history of the career of Edouard Manet, who becomes a sort of Impressionist round about 1870. But Edouard Manet is the least straightforward of painters, the most paradoxical, the most cavalier, the most complicated. And you might want to read uh, Anne Hansen Coffin's book. No, it's Anne Coffin Hansen's book, H-A-N-S-O-N, -S uh, on Manet. Or you might want to read uh, G.R. Hamilton's Manet and his critics. There are a lot of good writing on Manet because he's so fascinating and because he is such a thief and because he goes through such, such a whirligig. Here he is in 1861 and you can see that he's playing around with scale, huge top hat here, uh, and uh, some people seem much larger than they should be and some people seem so smaller. He is already, of course, approaching the gaiety of an Impressionist subject matter. And it's fascinating to put him next to Prendergast uh, Central Park. Here is, after all, the Tuileries. But 
at the same time, notice that he does things which are entirely unimpressionist. Uh, this has such a strong silhouette. Look at the absolute black, unmitigated blob of this uh, uh, frock coat, or the equally unmitigated black blob over here, or the brilliant piece of red just here. Uh, and there's a strong sense of linearity, and these very dark, sooty trees divide the painting much more like a Japanese uh, uh, print than like a piece of impressionist practice. And throughout the 1860s and 1870s, there are many attacks, there are many, there are many distractions from impressionism, there are many alternative ways of going. And Manet, let's have a look at the next, is somebody who is going to move in all sorts of different directions. But if we look at this detail of a famous Manet painting of the middle of the 1870s, we do notice that he's moved towards prismatic colors, he's moved towards that all-encompassing and wonderful skylit blue, he's moved towards a different way of looking at small elements, he's drawing in a different way, and indeed he is in some ways ceasing to draw. That is to say, everything has a softer and softer edge. You are pulled into an atmospheric envelope, and it is that fascinating atmospheric envelope, which is, of course, the envelope of continuous color. The idea is not that you ever see a bounding line to something, but when one color ceases to bombard your eye, another color is bombarding your eye. And those colors are, in fact, of course, much flatter. The colors are flatter, the cornea is flatter, and you are moving, therefore, through Impressionism to an astonishing and much deeper revolution. And it's a fundamental revolution between the whole notion of art from the Renaissance to the 19th century and art as we think of it from the late 19th century onwards. Art till the later part of the 19th century, from the time of Masaccio and Brunelleschi and Alberti, very much was concerned with the creation of illusory space. And the Impressionists really are the people who first, in a sense, deny illusory space. Because if light is the crucial issue, light fills any space that there is. Light is actually changed as it moves towards you by the atmosphere. Even a piece of light as it's coming towards your very eye and is about to knock you over is being subtly changed because people are breathing and changing its color and refracting it through the dampness of their breath. Uh, through the garlic which uh, they are mixing it up with, or whatever you like to think. So that you see here an absence of that whole notion of disegno, of the, of the bounding line, of the importance of the silhouette, of the importance of drawing in its more extended sense. Thus, of course, the Impressionists are deeply much within the following of Delacroix, who was more interested in color uh, than he was interested in line. And that's why, of course, they revolt from the ancient Angra, who dies in 1867 at the age of 87. And here you see a little detail of uh, the same painting by Manet, and you can see how he's alternating different little splatches and splodges of color, and how they can become quite brilliant and how they are all intermingled with reflection on the underside. Look at the reflected light here, and all that light is suffused with a certain element of blue which comes out of the sky, and then a certain element of this lovely Naples yellow which comes out of the yellow of the walls and the yellow of the floor. And all the time this light is reverberating and filling every little inch of space. But you also notice that uh, uh, Manet's uh, world is a world of... Uh, much different brushstrokes from those of Monet or Renoir. Monet and Manet have more in common than Renoir and Manet in terms of brushstroke. Renoir and Manet have more in, ter more in common in terms of preoccupation with subject matter. I told you that Manet is a difficult artist to understand. Well, you look at this painting of 1864 by Manet, and you are miles away, are you not, from the Olympia. Did he who made the lamb make thee? Did he who painted the Olympia paint the dead Christ? Hmm? And it is astonishing to think that Manet would paint such a thing as angels' wings, a world of symbolic imagination, which is totally forbidden to Impressionist practice, who have to see angels' wings before they can paint them. And Manet may see 
an iris's wings, but never an angel's. Uh, and this represents one little direction which Manet goes in for a moment, and this represents another. And you can see that Manet is, of course, pulled by, oh, one whole tradition, the tradition which stems from who? This must be obvious to you, that it stems from Goya and, of course, Jericho, because it's the execution of Maximilian which took place in Mexico, and Manet took the trouble of copying photographs, of using a great many photographs, particularly for his portrait of poor Maximilian. Uh, and, of course, he does one wonderful thing to the Goya. He turns this man aside and makes that casual fiddling with uh, uh, the safety catch or whatever it is. Entirely change the meaning of the painting, gives it a kind of supernal coolness and indifference. There he is, he's in the middle of an execution, and an execution is turned into something which you might see through the eyes of Mescaline. That is to say, with a sublime indifference because you're on an art for art's sake trip. That is the only real explanation of this person who takes no part in the action and, of course, therefore cools the action beyond all belief. Or again, about 1866, 1867, Manet, the, the influences not of Goya, but also the influences of Japanese art swell in him. And from a world in which he is interested in uh, the environment, he suddenly uh, descends to the famous little fife player, whose Contour is so absolutely extreme and so absolutely fundamental. I want you to look at those trousers because those trousers are so anti-impressionist, aren't they? They're the sense of reflected light. Well, of course, there is no reflected light because this person is living in a grey fog. He is actually standing upon a grey fog, mm? levitating upon a grey fog, and so the only kind of colour which might be reflected is perhaps a grey fog colour. But look at the whites. The whites refuse what they're so important for in Impressionist practice. And the whole thing has the elegant linearity, which is uh, so much Japanese. Let's go and have a look at the next, because we have absolutely no time. And there you are, you know it, because there's his famous portrait of Zola with the Japanese screen in, with the Japanese actor in, as well as uh, the Velasquez and his own Olympia. Uh, so he's pulled in so many different directions. Uh, you can see some of the directions. You can see uh, the Velasquez direction. Uh, you can see the Japanese direction. And then, in 1869-1870, Manet goes to Holland and immediately is pulled in yet another direction. And I should warn you painters hmm, that it isn't always a good idea to go to every museum that there is because you get pulled in so many different directions. You know, your buttock is pulled towards Rubens. Hmm? Your forelock is a pull towards Corbeil. Your shoulders uh, resound to a Rodin-esque impulse. Uh, I, will not, uh, I will not deal with the more intimate parts of your anatomy and uh, <laughs> the directions in which they might go. Uh, but in Holland, Manet discovers actually the artist of whom he is, the transmigrated descendant. In a former existence, Edouard Manet must have been Franz Haus. And here is Edouard Manet painting Le Bon Boc with, no, no, this comfortable bourgeois person with his slash waistcoat, with a brilliantly knobbly, look at the hands with their absolutely knobble knuckles, look at the brilliance of the highlights, look at the colour, uh, the greys and browns of the colour, and then you see house after house after house has the same kind of slashing brushstroke. Uh, has the same silly drunken people. And uh, I should show you the Laughing Cavalier, which is the epitome of smugness uh, and which uh, has that kind of um, fascination with character which you find in, in a, a Manet. Well, to everything else, Manet adds always his own dash of elegance. In his later years, when he's really very ill, he does a number of absolutely astonishing still lives of the most fascinating and formidable tonal uh, alternatives. And uh, you can see uh, how fastidious he is. Uh, here's one of his most charming paintings, a single stick of asparagus. And 
one of the things that is obviously very, very clear to uh, Manet is the mere fact, or the very mere making, the richness of the pigment is uh, extremely attractive. But the brush stroke here is a halcyon brush stroke, over and over and over again. After 1870, his stroke is halcyon, but of course his color is very often impressionist. And this, after all, commemorates how it could all be. In the 1850s, Daubigny, Charles Daubigny had already bought a little boat and he went traveling up the Seine and down the Seine in it and painted from the middle of the river. Well, Monet discovers this and then Manet discovers Monet discovering this and paints Monet discovering this and paints, paints Monet painting somebody else discovering this. And in the background is the, are the industrial suburbs of Paris and you can see that Manet likes a sense of structure, likes these broken brushstrokes, likes these brilliant blues, but is moved in an area, oh, in an area like that towards something much closer to impressionist practice. And one of the things that's absolutely fascinating is to watch on a single canvas an artist of high caliber changing his mind about the way he is going to do something. And Manet is fully capable. He's the sort of person who would start talking to you in French and then might throw in a bit of Latin and then say, oh, good Lord, in English, and then break into American and then break back into French. He's mercurial. Uh, he's even more mercurial than I am. And uh, here he is doing this famous suburb of Paris called Argenteuil. And you might want to concentrate on Argenteuil, remember, because you could say that Argenteuil is the place where Impressionism finally gels. It's a coming together of Manet, Monet, and Renoir, particularly at a charming little endroit called La Grenouillère, the frog re restaurant. Now, in the 1860s, Monet and Renoir had, of course, admired the Barbizon painters, had met Diaz, but, of course, their great hero, because of the Salon des Refusés, was Manet. And in the, in the middle of the 1860s, Monet decides to do a Manet. He decides to do a picnic. He goes to the forest of Fontainebleau and does a lot of sketches, and then he produces his picnic, which was planned to be on an absolutely enormous scale. And as you can see, very, very similar food. But look at the, look at the trees. Look at the brilliance of the uh, foliage. And if you look back at the stage scene, almost the photographic, the photographic office scenery, uh, of uh, Manet, you then see how Monet from the start wishes to flood uh, his painting with uh, the open air. And he wants to give it a kind of very nice immediate chic. Nudes are out, uh, but uh, dogs are in, uh, and uh, little signs on the trees are very happy. The, the painting was enormous, and finally what we have are cut up portions of this uh, very large painting. This is one of the cut-up portions, which I believe is in Stockholm. I'm not quite sure. And here you see, at this stage, Monet is borrowing very much uh, Manet's treatment of getting rid of half-tones, light and then dark, simplifying the drawing. It is a moment when uh, a Japanese influence is really very, very high. As you can see in this area, uh, Monet never really finished it, and it looks more like an 1890s painting, perhaps, of Toulouse-Lautrec uh, in the actual factual. And here's a, you know, a small sketch in which you can see the movement of the paint. You can see the absolute love of the brilliant light and the tone here, which actually leaps through between them. Uh, it's a great unfinished work, uh, which he was never fully satisfied with. Here we see a detail of the middle portion. And it was succeeded, come here, next, next please, we can see it was succeeded in Monet's work by this large entrenched painting of Girls in the Garden. Camille posed for one girl after another. It must have been quite costly from a milliner's point of view. And in fact, of course, poor Monet was always terribly, terribly short of money. Uh, unlike, oh, please don't keep opening and shutting that bloody door. Excuse my language. Hmm? And you can see again the sort of Japanese contours. Well, it's worth looking at Monet's career, which, as you know, is a very long one. It lasts for 86, 87 years. And it goes through a number of vicissitudes, but people always say that Monet is really the quintessential Impressionist. And it's funny, he actually starts by making caricatures of school friends. 
By the early 1860s, he's come under the influence of Boudin. And in the middle of the 1860s, he's painting pictures like this, street scenes. Uh, you notice the color, fairly dark. You notice a strong structure of dark shadows. And you notice a strong linear structure. You notice one other thing which is very fascinating, that concentration upon going down the street, upon fairly simple linear recession, which the Impressionists use as a kind of anchor for their atmospheres. A lot of Monet's early work is of beach scenes. And here, I think you can see him following in the world of Courbet, who in the late 1850s and early 1860s also paints in Normandy, paints these northern uh, scenes with rather growling, heavy clouds. And in Courbet's case, just as he likes the most massive and extraordinarily heavy women, Courbet likes the most massive and extraordinarily heavy waves. Uh, to, be, to be bumped into by a Courbet wave is to submit yourself to a very powerful force of nature. Uh, Monet is always more cheerful and always more uh, dotted about and more informal. But this is quite dark in many places. Here's another one, and you can see him responding in a very, very interesting way. And this, I think, is, this, I think, is really very, very important. At this stage, he's responding to the movement in the sky rather than the color. But Monet has got into the habit of painting entirely on the motif. He does that more early. He touches up less when he gets back to the studio than any of the other Impressionist painters. And the sheer drama of changing light is obviously what grabs him at this stage. And he's thrilled by this sudden funny little patch of yellow, which actually is quite close to the way that Manet would use a bit of lemon yellow or uh, uh, Naples. And in 1867, we have this fascinating and somewhat self-contradictory painting. On the one hand, uh, the sail is painted in a very, very linear fashion. On the other hand, we're beginning to get in various places an increasing sense of the importance of shadow, an increasing sense of the importance of reflected light, and a kind of easier atmosphere, and of course, extraordinary brilliance in the blue. And you can imagine how exciting that was to Monet himself, and how frightening it was to many of the people who saw it. They'd never seen so much unadulterated blue in their lives, so much fresh sea, and they could hardly believe it. And they couldn't easily believe the brilliance of the reds in the foreground, or even the color of the shadow there. And the strength of the opposition of the tones was another matter. It's already interesting that about 1866, 1867, Monet does what I think is absolutely crucial for Impressionist practice. He starts painting snow scenes. Now, why is that crucial for Impressionist practice? It is, of course, because when you have a snow scene and the sun comes out, the quality of reflected light increases and increases and increases. You can surely, all of you, remember waking up at morning when it snowed in the night and how the ceiling looks so much whiter than it's ever been before. And you're conscious of being in a world of totally different light and when you go out, everything looks so entirely different. And of course, the color of the sky on a bright sunlight day when you have snow, uh, the color of the sky gets reflected everywhere, and you move into a serene and blue world. But it's interesting, in this early, in this early painting, Monet has not really explored the brilliant blues of sunlight on snow, but he's beginning to play with the whole notion of white as an entirely reflective color. And then, 1869, 1870, La Guenriere. And at La Guenriere, you can never be quite sure whether you've got a Monet, or whether you've got a Renoir, or whether you're facing a Bert Morisot, or whether you're facing a Manet. And uh, I hesitate and look, hopefully, at the signature in the corner here, because I'm a little close to it. Mm? And I can read the signature. Mm? And what does it say? Oh, no, it doesn't say Pizarro. It's too cheerful for Pizarro. Let's have a look at the next one. Hmm? Well, what does it say now? No, the signature's over there. Hmm? Well, the last one was, what is this one? Who is this one by? Manet. Well, no, it isn't Manet. It could be Manet, but it isn't Manet. It is Monet. And the last one was Renoir. And at that stage, Renoir is a little bit brighter than Monet, but Monet is catching up. And, and then we suddenly find, in the middle of the 1870s, Monet and Renoir painting very close together. Look what they're doing. They're moving beyond 
Argent Tai, they're moving into a world where shape almost ceases to exist. I think this is why they became so fascinated by big meadows, in which every little movement of color uh, is exhibited just by this extraordinary movement back through here. There is no easy way, there's no line, there's no path through the middle of this meadow. There is just constant change of color, movement from the brilliant reds into the more mauvey colors, and in the same way from the sky, from the more mauvey colors in the back of the sky to the more deeply opposed tints of white and blue. And then you see people here who then reappear back there as the day slightly changes, and there's an absence of contour, just a little anchor. That's what the people are there for in order to anchor the grass down for a tiny moment. And, of course, the less you have shapes, the more you have pigment. We can see that in a Monet, we could easily see it uh, in a Renoir, uh, and Renoir in the middle of the 1870s is some very explosive and wonderful paintings. Let's have a look at the next one, which is a particular favorite of mine, uh, of Renoir. It's called Le Coup de Vent, uh, that wonderful moment when uh, the uh, uh, little breeze has sprung up. And look at the absolute and fascinating chaos here. And Renoir refuses actually to sort this out for you. That's a most interesting thing. He says, this is what it looks like. I cannot explain to you what it is. And that's an extraordinary decision. It's a decision which is made sometimes in the paintings of Vermeer, but with really very different intent. But in these landscapes of the middle of the 1870s, uh, the sense of the texture, the sense of uh, 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 organic chaos, if you like, and the sense of the fugitive nature of the clouds, uh, and the flickering of the color. And why do they like the broken clouds? Because the broken clouds produce broken shadows. And you get into a world of Gerard Mann Hopkins. Glory be to God for dappled things. Hmm? And probably Gerard Mann Hopkins wrote that almost at the height of the Impressionist movement in the 1870s. And you might well want to think that the Impressionists are singing a hymn of praise to whomever or whatever in praise of dappled things couple colored things. The most famous, in some ways, of all the Impressionist paintings is this impression, because it was entitled Impression, and that was what helped to give the journalists a clue. And of course, journalists desperately need at least three or four clues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they got a clue. And you can imagine that people who were used to even uh, the world of the uh, Barbizon found it very difficult to interpret this. And you might easily say, well, what is this, these many bales of straw doing, floating in the water? And who has dropped an ink blot on the page? And what is that penny, that new from the US mint penny doing in the sky, if you felt a little bit hostile? And of course, many artists and many members of the public felt thus hostile. Uh, but Monet would justify it because that was not exactly just what he saw, but how he saw it could be interpreted in paint. Uh, you see that for Manet, for Monet, Manet's brushstroke is really quite important. There's another interesting thing here, and that is more problematic and puzzling. This is a scene of an industrial, of an industrial uh, port. And, again, you must never, never expect absolute consistency. Because Monet looks as though he's dissolving everything into a kind of neo turnerian mist, and then quite suddenly he's back again with very, very Japanese contours uh, to his boats, just a year later. Just a year later. Do not, I mean, do not expect for absolute consistency. Look at the fascinating difference between, this is another Monet of the middle of the 1870s, Argentine, the fascinating, here we have an con absolutely consistent mm, touch for a bit. Blob, 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 little blob, little blob, little blob, little blob. Mm -hmm. And we have a broken contour, and that broken contour actually gets to the boat. And then quite suddenly, he sharpens it up like mad just there, mm, and pushes that sail forward by giving you a hard edge just in one place in the picture. And of course, painters don't paint by recipes. They don't get out their uh, Julia Childs and say, take three pinches of titanium and stir well. They're all the time maneuvering past 
dreadful difficulties. And you can see, in fact, a rather dreadful difficulty which has emerged there. And a bit of the white has escaped from this boat, and he smudged it in there. What you feel, of course, always in Monet is something very extraordinary, which is his very powerful physical being. Of the Impressionists, he was far and away the most physically strong. In his 70s, he still looked like an absolute bull. He used to wear mm, very, very thick English tweeds. He had an enormously thick neck, which as he got older, got thicker and thicker and thicker and stronger. And even in his 80s, you see, when his eyesight was going extremely badly and was having operations for cataract, there was the same fantastic vigor and directness. And you, can, you, can, you always have to think of that immensely manly, direct response to nature. Uh, and if you take him away from his inspiration, then what happens to him? His trajectory is so different from other trajectories. And we'll look a little bit more of it. See, there's an 1860 painting. And uh, you can see how he does love contour. Here's an early 1870 painting which shows his interest in industrial scenes which rise perhaps to a height with his famous series of the Gare Saint-Lazare in 1877, which is such a fascinating mixture of industrial scenery and uh, optical interest in smoke. Uh, uh, this one is one of the less beautifully and richly colored ones. Unfortunately, many Monets are not in the slide library. Towards 1880, he, his first wife dies, and then he meets a woman called Hoshedda, and slowly his finances improve. From 1865 to about 1880, uh, Monet is a very poor man. And he's often writing a letter to Renoir saying, for God's sake, bring a loaf of bread. There's nothing left in the house. And you can imagine it's like the sort of situation which exists on uh, Walnut or Washington or Chestnut. Uh, you know, you dash down to the food bin and hope that somebody's left a stray bagel in the place. Uh, very, very short of money. Then he starts getting a more settled life, and he goes and lives at a place called Vetai, and he paints the local scenery at Vetai, and he paints the garden at Vetai. And his passion for intimate foliage increases. And uh, you can see that what is happening is that bigger scenes interest him less and less and less. The amount of space in the painting interests him less and less and less. And the scintillation of light uh, on flowers and the variety of that scintillation uh, becomes more and more central to him. Uh, and consequently, wonderful qualities of yellow sunflowers. Here's another painting from Vetaille period, the 1880s or so, where his colors become so luscious, I can show you some details. And you then see one thing, he must have had very, very strong eyesight, just to concentrate on this. And the kind of drama which becomes implicit in his painting. And I want you to think that this is another thing that uh, painters have some very interesting choices. And one of the choices is always to say outside your painting. And always to treat it with a kind of cool, distinguished uh, distance and be your own critic all the time. Here, he is so involved in the act of painting that he cannot easily be a distant critic. He's a close critic. And he is chancing more and more and more on an immediate inspiration. And one of the things about Impressionism is it leads in the direction of immediate inspiration. So it leads to a whole notion of art as something infinitely more spontaneous. You see, the older notion of art was the notion in which you would work at a single painting perhaps for six months. And then you polish off a little buttock here, and then you'd get a kneecap right there, and then you'd get a helmet, you know, you'd redraw the, 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 the contour of a helmet. Here, you're swept away by the circumstances immediately in front of you, and you paint in a kind of pandemonium of inspiration. Uh, I think I've got another slide which will take you even further into that pandemonium of inspiration. And of course, Monet, from the middle of the 1880s onwards, going his own way with a breakup. And it's a breakup partly because they're all older, partly because they all get married, partly because they all get a little bit more prosperous, except poor Sisley, who really is always terribly poor. And Pissarro's fortunes are a ding dong. Pissarro marries a serving woman. And so he's pushed out in one direction. Hmm? 
Renoir goes to Italy and becomes entirely different at the beginning of the 1880s. And Monet retires to his garden, and from Vetai he goes to Giverny, and at Giverny the garden embowers him more and more and more, until you, looking at the paintings, might well feel that you were suffering from a complex allergy. Hmm? Uh, there's so much pollen in, in the air uh, of a mature Monet. Uh, Giverny is near the Ept, and uh, Monet eventually bought the meadow here. He prevented these willows from being cut down. But you can see there's a kind of fascinating seesaw between atmospherics and contour in Monet. Monet is pulled towards the Japanese elegance of contour, and then he's pulled back towards the atmospheric. And in this one, he's halfway between the two. There's another wonderful one of Poplar's Adept, and you see how much more sharp the contours are. Now, this is early 1890. It's almost the time of the great cathedral theories. And the interesting thing, of course, is that what is happening is that while the contour is very important, something else is also very important. And that is, he's closing up the top of the picture so that you can't see into any great depth. And the top and the bottom are knit together as a pla flat, plain surface. And that's the meaning of some of the poplar series, which, of course, gets transformed into these much later flags uh, uh, water irises. Uh, but the water irises are a repetition, uh, well after 1900, of the linearity of some of the poplar series. The poplar series took place at the same time, uh, uh, roughly speaking, as the great haystack series. But unfortunately, somebody has secreted almost all the haystacks as though he was a sort of neo Bosch person and was wanting the hay wane. Uh, so I'm showing you uh, more and more of Giverny. Uh, and the wonderful flowers. And of course, Monet increasingly spent all his life planting the flowers. He entertained Japanese visitors who brought him the most marvelous uh, and extraordinary tree peonies and other very rare species. And then he had a great Japanese built uh, bridge to be built because, of course, by now, Durand Ruel, his great dealer, had uh, made pots and pots of money for him uh, in the European, but even more in the American market. And you see the late Monet color, the thick paint, the wonderful mauves and pinks, uh, the total, total abolition of greys and browns, the uh, intense prismaticity, and the closing up and thickening over, and abbreviation, so that Monet cares to explain less and less and less, until right at the end of his life, when some people say, of course, he was suffering very badly from cataract and couldn't see what he was doing, uh, he does the great Nymphias series, a series of water lilies. He makes this wonderful acre of water lily pond and then paints it. Now, a lot of these are very, very large paintings. And what has happened? The painting exists in one receding plane. The whole notion of a vertical and horizontal plane has disappeared. One of the coordinates of almost all painting has gone. And that means that you are really faced with a surface which has no edges. You float. And that sense of floatingness, uh, which of course is close to the floating world of Ukiyoe, but is also close to the floating world of Sam Francis uh, and uh, the neo-impressionists, uh, abstract impressionists of the 1950s. And Jackson Pollock's drippery is no freer than these extraordinary rushy, brushy, flushy brushstrokes uh, of uh, Monet all over uh, his painting. And yet, there remains this wonderful illusion of water lilies. Here's one way you can actually appreciate the extraordinarily massive carelessness and yet intense uh, concentration uh, of his facture. Wonderful, wonderful kind of painting. And uh, all the time, he's inventing new color harmonies. Uh, Giverny is one of his poems, but he makes forays from it. He makes forays from it uh, towards Rouen Cathedral, where in Rouen, Pissarro is also painting. And uh, again, notice what has happened with the poplar trees is now happening with the cathedrals. The sky is being excluded. You are moving into a single plane, and you're just looking at billowing color. And of course, the cathedral might just as well be a bank of complex herbage even more so perhaps here. And in this last one, sky has totally disappeared. And you're almost lost. It's almost as though you're painting in a maze. 
uh, and you're watching uh, the reflections of little bits of light off the ground, mm, bright sunlight here, uh, onto this mouldering stone, uh, and the subject matter has totally disappeared. I mean, that's the other thing that's really interesting. I mean, you don't think of it as a cathedral. You don't think it's a place for Gothic devotions. Mm? You think of it as a film of extraordinary, sunny, radiated color. And the same thing happens when he goes to Venice, or when, at the end of the 1890s and the early 1900s, he comes to London. And of course, why does he love London? Because it's so full of mists and foss, fro fogs and bouillard and broom, uh, and uh, mysterious tinted light. And it is at that stage that he looks at Turner again. And here's Charing Cross Bridge, a railway bridge. And here's uh, uh, the Houses of Parliament, no longer looking at all as Pugin and Barry had intended them to be, but like some gigantic, de decadent, incandescent wedding cake uh, stuck about with candles and with clouds fristing and frosting, mm, iridescent like mother of pearl, uh, a great hymn to uh, uh, the prism and a dissolution of all sorts of solid form. And it is interesting, you see, that He's doing this at the sort of time that Kandinsky is beginning to think about non-figurative art. Another slightly less adventurous one, where the return to some of the dark browns uh, and blues contrasted, which you find in the 1860s. And then another one, which is almost impossible to read, and I would guess by now that my time for reading it to you has gone by. I'm sorry if I cast a little... Uh, gloom over you. Uh, you. You said that, um, did the, the Impressionists were the first to move away from illusory space? Illusory space. Illusory, what do you mean by illusory space?